Hello, and welcome to Jason Cabinet's Experience. Our guest today is Dow Wei. Dow Wei, are you ready to be great today? Yeah, doing well. Thanks for having me, Jason. Dow Wei is a graduate of Vanderbilt University and co-founder of, um, how do you say the name of your company, Aloha? Yeah, Aloha, Aloha. Really a, a tech startup <laughs> focused on making software development easy and accessible for everyone. He is part of the five-person co-founder team, including David Paulwin, while they were at college. Since its founding in 2018, over 300 startup founders across North America and Europe have used the platform to outsource the software development overseas. He enjoys writing country music and playing at bars and venues in his favorite city of Nashville, Tennessee, this very time. Thanks for being here today. I, I really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for having me again. So let's start off something personal first. I'll talk about your background. So um, you, you're born in China and you and your family moved at eight years old. Can you talk about what you remember, remember about moving here from China, like the challenges? Like, was it like hard being an immigrant, all that kind of stuff, you know? Um, yeah, it was, it was really challenging. I mean, the, I think the best way to describe it is, um, you know, you, you're, standing next to, you're standing next to a pool of like really cold water and you don't really want to jump in, but someone just kind of shoves you in and, and you're just expected to, to swim in this this new pool of water and you don't really know how to swim right so that's that's the type of environment i think that i was kind of thrown into when i was eight years old and i first came to the states because i immigrated here from china and i didn't know a single word of english uh at the age of eight and i started second grade um here in the states uh grew up in memphis tennessee right so it, it was a pretty drastic transition from Tianjin, china where i grew up that was my hometown a city of about 15 million people uh, moving to Memphis, Tennessee, and going to school there, uh, that, picking up a new language and a new culture and everything like that. So that's one thing <laughs> in America to realize. Like I, I was in the army, I spent three years in, in Seoul. I think Seoul is like fourteen million people. I think most people in the states don't realize how like huge the cities in Asia are, right? It, yeah, it's huge. Uh, you got. I mean, Tianjin is one of the top five or top three of the larger cities in in China, but most people haven't heard about it. But uh, you know, you got Beijing that's 20 plus million, Shanghai that's 25 million, uh, Tokyo is 30 million, I think. Mumbai is up there in the 30 millions. And um, yeah, it's the, the population is just uh, it's pretty crazy over there. So you might not know, you might not know this, but you, you, so why did y'all go to Memphis for? Because like usually, you know, it's like, I mean, I could wrong, it's like Memphis, like in a pretty white city, you know, like I know here in Seattle, there's a lot of Asian communities here, Houston, LA. Is that any particular reason why, why that city? Yeah, so my dad actually came here a few years before my grandparents brought me to the state. So what happened was he went to grad school here. My mom came here with him. My mom's parents actually took care of me in China for a few years while my, my parents were getting situated in the state because they weren't sure they were, if they were going to stay here or, or not, right? But the immigration status is really up in the air, and that's all dependent on what job you get out of grad school. So he graduated, uh, he went to Baylor University down in Waco, Texas, uh, and he graduated from Baylor and the, the only job offer that he got was, um, was a job in Memphis. So they picked up their bags and they drove from Waco to Memphis all, all the way back in 2001. Uh, and they got situated in the Memphis and that was when my grandparents were brought to the States in the summer of 2002. So we're coming up on a, my 20 year anniversary uh, of being in the States. <laughs> And, and do you have dual citizenship with both countries? I, I'm a naturalized citizen of uh, the United States. I'm, you have to forego the citizenship, the Chinese citizenship, once you get um, do you once okay. you get na once you get naturalized. So, and, and do you ever go back um, and visit? I do try to. The last time I went back was September 2019, right before the pandemic. Yeah. Right now, with all of the lockdowns and stuff, unfortunately, is. Um, yeah, you know, it's very difficult yeah, to, yeah. to go it's, back. <laughs> like COVID's making a resurgence in China, unfortunately. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Kind of. Uh, I think. I think the government there is is reacting in a very interesting way. Let's put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> I think it, there's not that many COVID cases, relatively speaking, but I think uh, they're they're locking down certain cities to you know demonstrate a certain level of of uh, power exertion and control. Yeah. Um, that they have so. So right now we we haven't gone back yet, but hopefully in 2023, maybe 2024, we can go back to visit some family. We've still got a lot of family over there. 
Um, so, um, but yeah. <laughs> so talk about this. It seems like my point of view, like, you know, a lot of immigrants, immigrants from the States, you know, of course they struggle at first, but then, you know, they like, they the quote unquote lived American dream. Like, you know, they're saying like they over, like excel, like, you know, startups, founders, business, like immigrants come just like do like, so well versus we we'll out of regular America, right? Is this just, what do you think the reason for that is? Why, why immigrants do so well? Yeah, versus an average American, uh, so to speak, you know? Cause like every immigrant I know, mm -hmm. like they're like, they're crushed it, so to speak, right? They're, they're, they're doing so well. Is it cause like they just appreciate what America is offering where most Americans like, you know, you know, you take it for granted, so to speak? Yeah. That's a good question, because um, hmm, I, I think it's the, the, yeah, I think it's like the immigrant mindset, right? Like you sort of travel all the way across the world to find a better opportunity in the United States. At least that's what my parents did. And I can say that is the same story with many of my friends who grew up in immigrant families. Uh, my, my wife is Italian and she grew up in a, you know, Italian immigrant family um and they they just have that level of work ethic uh throughout the generations she's third generation american i'm sort of one and a half generation um but yeah i think i think it's i think it's a mix of you know we, we appreciate the we don't take it for granted like the freedom and the opportunity that we have here and we see the contracts between U.S. versus China, U.S. versus India, U.S. versus Africa, right? Where we're from versus where we are, where we are at now. Like we don't want to go back to, like my my parents fought very very hard to get our green card, and it took us about a little over ten years to get it, and it took another five years for me to get naturalized as a citizen of the United States. So a little over fifteen years total for me to go from you know being fresh off the plane <laughs> to being naturalized as a citizen. So it's a pretty long process and they fought long and hard to, to stay here and be, you know, a legal immigrant here in the United States, right? So they really, really appreciate like the opportunity and the freedom that we get here uh, versus, you know, what they experienced back in communist China, back in the nineties and eighties, seventies, where they grew up. Um, yeah, I mean yeah, I mean, you hear yeah. the story of the time, the circular story, you know, immigrant come here with $10 a pocket, no English. And then, of course, it's generalizing things. And then 10 years later, they own like a multi million dollar business, right? <laughs> all, all three of their yeah, kids are graduating from the top one, two, three of Harvard, right? I mean, of course, I'm generalizing things, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think it's, it's hard work um, and, you know, a bit of luck and, you know, um, but, but mostly hard work. If you, if you work hard, you, you tend to have, just better luck. Uh, uh, yes. If you meet new people, network, and and I don't know, just try to yeah expand yourself, growth mindset, right? Like how how we met was just I, I took a I took a call and I you know kind of got matched with this this company that that was uh, you know booking people on podcasts and stuff like that, right? And that's how this opportunity came about. Yes. Um, but uh, had I not talked to that person, I would have never, we would have never met, right? And we wouldn't yeah, be having exactly. a conversation like that. So it's just saying yes, being a go-getter, trying to seek opportunities rather than sort of having opportunities come to you, right? Uh, you're, you're trying to open doors for yourself. You're trying to, um, you know, control your own destiny, so to speak, your life. Yeah, you, I mean, you're right. What, what's that saying, you know? opportunity knocks on everyone's door but most people don't open it or something like that yeah 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 yeah. exactly so um the bus runs every day <laughs> yes yes um that's i think morgan freeman loves to say that uh the bus runs every day so um so yeah i think it's, it's a bit of that you know is is hard work it's appreciation for this country and and the freedom and the opportunity that it, pre it presents um, and the, and, you know, a little bit of luck with that as well, because I haven't, not every immigrant family that I've met, uh, is, is all of those things. I've met some people who uh, came here that are not hardworking and they have a little bit of bad luck and, you know, they, they don't necessarily sort of fit that into that mold, uh, per se, but, um, but I say a vast majority of people who, you know, work hard and really are grateful and appreciate, um, the freedom and the opportunities that they're presented, they typically 
succeed um, and do pretty well. <laughs> yeah, I agree. So, so next, talk about how you talk about how you got involved with the writing country music and singing at, at the bars of your local town. How that come oh, about? Gosh. <laughs> um, that's an interesting story. So, I I met this guy named Andre. Um, many years ago, it was summer of 2015. So this is how many years ago was that? Seven years ago from now. Um, and we were neighbors at that point. I was a rising junior at Vanderbilt and he was a rising senior at Belmont. Um, and we met uh, that summer at this pool party that the apartment was hosting. And that I was like, started talking to him and uh, he had a pretty cool story. He's Asian American too, he's from Hong Kong adopted i grew up in boston uh and uh well immigrated from hong kong to boston and then grew up in boston and he went to Ber berkeley college of music uh studying under john mayer uh and then came down to nashville to songwrite when he was 18. so he started writing with uh some of the now big name artists but back then like no one really knew them like uh brett eldridge john party um and, and a few others and uh, so he started writing country music for them. And, and so, so we, we got acquainted and he said he wanted to be like the first Asian American, uh, recording artist. Uh, and I, I thought that was really interesting. I, I wasn't really into country music at that time, uh, all the way back in 2015. I was like, oh, that's really cool. We should stay in touch. You know, so we, I added him on Facebook, started following his Facebook page and, and stuff like that. Love to support another Asian brother, right? Like in, in whatever endeavor that that he's, he's doing, I was like, hey, I would love to keep up with you. We'd love to follow what you're doing. Um, so we actually didn't talk to each other for about four years. Now, fast forward to the end of 2018, um, one of my best friends got me into songwriting and because uh, I used to, I used to be uh, very active in, in leading worship on, Vanderbilt's campus uh, in a college ministry. So I didn't really have kind of a musical, I guess, outlet like right out of college. Uh, now now I do have a tons of musical outlets. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm leading worship at my church with my wife. I'm writing music and recording music with, with Andre now. And that's a story I'll tell later. But my, my buddy Clay got me into songwriting back in the end of 2018. Um, and I, and that was also the year that I got into listening to country music as well. Um, so I fell in love with country music and songwriting. And uh, towards the beginning of 2019, I reached back out to Andre and was like, hey, I'm not sure if you remember me, but we met like four years ago. And, uh, you know, I just wanted to update you that I'm in the country music scene, I'm writing music. And I, I didn't expect anything of it. I was like, I, I'm just, I'm just, you know, in love with country music and I'm also writing music. So I just thought of, I just thought of you, uh, just wanted to reach out. Right. And he actually messaged me back on Facebook. He's like, yeah, man, I, I do remember you. Let's, let's meet up sometime for coffee. So we caught up all the way back. And, um, it was, uh, I think April, May of 2019, I want to say, uh, and at the end of our, our hangout, he was like, Hey, why don't we do, why don't we do a write together? Um, and that was the beginning of, uh, I think our, our friendship and, and because we, we only got acquainted that one time and we sort of loosely stayed in touch on Facebook, didn't really talk to each other for four years. <laughs> and we caught, we caught back up in 2019 um, and started writing music, music together. So fast forward to now, you know, we've written probably over 40 songs together. Uh, I, when I recently got married, he was, he was a groomsman in my wedding. So he's, he's become one of my best friends and um, I'm just here to sort of support him in his career. I don't really write music with, other people really, I just write music with with him, and um, you know we we've played together a few times around town with shows and stuff like that. So that's sort of the story of how how I got to uh, just just so happen to stumble into the country music scene here in Nashville. But <laughs> so so, what's your process for writing a country music song? Is it is it is, is, are you writing songs the same whether it's country rap, or R and B, classical? Is the writing process the same or? Well, I haven't written in, I haven't written other genres, but I would say it's different uh, because with country music, there's certain elements in it that do not exist outside of country music or, or folk music, right? So, so there's certain 
ways you write the lyrics that are more descriptive and uh we i we, mean, I we, mean we have your, a, your, your wife has to leave you the horse has to die <laughs> right right exactly we, we call it we call it putting furniture in the lyrics right you you want to write uh, uh, uh it's, it's like storytelling that's why i love that's why i fell in love with country songwriting because i love telling stories and this is a way for me to express that storytelling through through music um so you're sort of writing more of a story you're depicting uh, the lyrics in a more concrete way rather than uh, in pop music or um i don't know in alternative music it's, it's a little bit more abstract the lyrics are a little bit more abstract and when you hear someone like i don't know Imagine Dragons or Billie Eilish or something like something like those type of artists, and you hear the lyrics. It's not necessarily something you can fully grasp or understand when you when you hear it. But when you hear country music, you can actually follow the plot line from verse to chorus, to verse again, to the bridge, into the chorus. Right? It's sort of depicting a, a whole story. So yeah, there is a process to writing uh, country music, and I think there's probably a different process for writing R and B or rap or pop or any other genres so so when you do your writing like you like sit down at one take like an hour write a song in one hour you like write a line take a break oh gosh. Verse another later how does that work it it typically takes three to four hours uh maybe longer um you know if we can finish a write within one session which is we, we typically take about three hours to do a, a write session and not all of the times we finish the song. So maybe we got one verse down in the chorus and then we come back the following week and we and we meet up and we write the second verse and bridge or something like that. Or sometimes we're just on a roll and we get the whole song done in three hours, which I think is, that's a really good timing to steam out a whole song pretty much within three hours. Um, but you know, you feel differently on different days. It's kind of like weightlifting or running or any type of sports. It's like you you feel differently on different days depending on how your body is functioning or feeling that day, right? So some days we get on a roll and we're hammering out an entire song that's very catchy within two to three hours. Uh, but other days we're sitting for three hours and <laughs> we've come up with you know a few lines. And that's and that totally depends on the topic. That totally depends on how we feel about the song. It depends on how passionate we are about the story and, and, and stuff like that because some topics are just easier to write than other than other topics so when, when you're writing a song do you already have the music for the song or does the or music come after you wrote the song how does that work you mean the melody of the song yeah, yeah no or, the music uh, like that the actual music yeah um that's a good question i'd say for us you know, we've written so many songs together that it's, we got a set process. So it's typically we meet and he's the ideas guy. I'm like, all right, Andre, like what, what type of, what idea do you got for us today? So he brings that, that idea to the table, that prompt, if you were writing an essay or a book or something, it would be sort of the same as a prompt. Um, and, um, you know, I'll, I'll give you an example. So one of our, one of our songs is called um, Irish Goodbye, right? And it's all about uh, the story that we're trying to craft is all about uh, a, a girl that is dating you and she completely ghosts you out of the blue, right? And, and she, the Irish goodbye at the prompt is because someone leaves a party without saying goodbye to the people. So at, that's at the party, right? So that's sort of the prompt and we sort of kind of base our song off of that, uh, that topic. So from there, then we construct the, the verses and, and the choruses. Uh, but typically we try to figure out like some sort of a basic tune, basic melody, basic chord progression. Um, and, uh, and then we keep on building on top of that. So sometimes it could be the melody of a chorus. Sometimes it could be the melody of a, of a post-chorus. And we build on that foundation and we keep expanding that into the rest of the song. And do you also um, go to different bars and sing and stuff? He does a lot more because uh, he's actual he's actual artist. I'm not a I'm not a recording artist. I'm just a, I'm just a writer. So, I mean, sometimes I play at uh, we have in Nashville. This is a Nashville thing, but Nashville has writers round because there's so many songwriters in Nashville. 
Um, I'm not sure how common it is outside of Nashville, but you would have writers rounds where you go to different venues and bars around town. And there's a, there's a lineup of writers on stage. There's about four or five of us. And you go down the line and you kind of just sing a different song every time it goes around to be your turn. And there's people in the bar, like with drinks and stuff and people are cheering you on. So that's, that's always really fun. So that's different than an actual show, right? An actual show is people are buying tickets to see you perform. A writer's round is typically free. You go there and you just uh, listen to some live music, drink some, drink some, you know, beer and and eat some good food with friends. Uh, so it's a really more relaxed environment than an actual show. I have to imagine the nightlife in Nashville was like top notch. I would think. Oh yeah, it's awesome. It's awesome. You know, I, I don't really get out that much anymore, but um, it's uh, the bachelor and bachelorette capital of the world. I feel like it's just so much stuff going on downtown <laughs> and, um, and around town. You see a lot of, yeah, a lot so, of crazy stuff going on. So yeah. what, what are you trying to do with your with this music writing? You're like trying to make a career out of it? It's a side hustle, something you're doing for fun? Like suppose someone came off you like a contract. Would you take it and like drop all the, everything else you're doing or you keep on doing it? <laughs> You know, I think I think it's something that I'll only do with my buddy Andre. I'm not trying to get a publishing deal or anything like that. I think um, I think he has a really good brand behind him. He's written several songs that have charted in the past um, with with current uh, famous country music artists, um, and and he's trying to sort of be a B list or A list country music artist. So I'm not trying to like tour with them or perform with them I'm, i just want to be that i just want to be there with them that I, I hope to continue writing songs with them we enjoy each other's company we love working with each other on on songs and, and stuff like that um so hopefully i can keep writing with them and uh you know if he if the songs do chart obviously that becomes a you know like a revenue stream or actual side hustle but so far it's it's uh it's been all fun nice. <laughs> So next, um, change the subjects. You spend some time as a Lyft driver. Can you tell us some of the couple of like, like off the wall, crazy yeah. Lyft experience, you, driver experiences you had? Oh gosh, yeah. Um, and this was in Nashville? This was in Nashville. I did it for two summers. Uh, I did about 2,500 rides on Lyft. Um, what's, a, what's a crazy story? Uh, you know, I haven't had any bad experiences. Most of the, all, all of the rides were, were very, the passengers were very, very friendly. Um, but, uh, you know, they, I would say, I would say um, there were, there were a few, there were a few, I guess, um, strange coincidences. Like you would just get, uh, you and you would drive around the city and, you know, you would drive around someone in your car and you have a conversation with them and you get to know them, you, you get to know their name and literally, I don't know, a few months later or a year later, you you end up getting matched with them again somewhere in part of town and you're like, hey, you're that so-and-so person that, that rode in my car like a few months ago or something like that. So that's always a like a crazy coincidence and um, there's always a lot of crazy sort of bachelor, bachelorette parties that... Uh, Pitch lift rides, uh, and you know they go into town and all that stuff. So that's now, always pretty as fun a, as a driver. Around. Did you make decent money? How's that work? Um, yeah, it's uh back then it was it was good money. I'm with the gas prices as it is now. I'm not sure how how profitable it is, but back then you know I would I would drive around in my minivan that I had, and I would drive you know lift what they call it lift plus lift XL. Um, so on a weekend, I would I could pull in around like forty bucks an hour. Uh, obviously, you're paying for your own gas and insurance, but um, but to me at the time that you know I was unemployed, out of college, and you know during college I was doing it for one summer to sort of make some side income to sort of pay for my rent here in Nashville and and support myself. Um, so back then it was it was pretty solid money. Um, Again, not not sure what the environment is now, but I'm sure it's uh, pretty decent money if you if you put in the work. It's hard work, but I mean I, I enjoyed it, but it's, it's definitely hard work. You're you're sitting 
in a car um, for eight to 10 hours a day, pretty much. Uh, and national traffic is terrible. So, <laughs> And the drivers are, are almost worse than the actual traffic itself. So. Yeah, I think, it's, I think it's everywhere. Like I always say, I'm a firm believer that everyone should have to retake their driver's license just every five years, right? Because like people, <laughs> I mean, you get it 16 every time you're 40 or 50 or even 30, like you have all these bad habits, right? I, I don't know traffic up there in seattle how's it's it's pretty bad of course everyone of course it's not a competition everyone says the traffic is the worst you know but i i've been on the highway stop like 20 minutes because the traffic doesn't move it's yeah because my my house is like maybe 45 miles from where i work at it'll easily take me like an hour and have two hours to drive it you know oh gosh yeah but usually i usually i catch the train or the or the bus usually plus how big is seattle is it like three million people or see it's not that big it's like Maybe like maybe five hundred, six hundred thousand people. Like the whole area, of Seattle, Tacoma. Really? Yeah. Oh wow. It's Seattle. It's, it's not this big. Like the whole state of Washington only has like three point five million people in it, right? Oh my goodness. Yeah, Seattle. Because I, I, I know Austin's bigger, San Antonio's bigger. Yeah, Seattle's not a, a big city like people think it is. It's pretty yeah. small. Yeah. Well, even else. Nashville is. Uh, I think our metro area is over a million easily. Yeah. Maybe one point one million people, but. No, I, I always thought that Seattle had more people because you guys have, you know, crazier rent prices than, than we do, yeah. and crazier real estate prices. Than we yeah, do, so. we're pretty small. Um, yeah. So next, I think I found this on your link. I found someone doing my research. It said um, you need to focus on sales decks over pitch decks. Can you talk about what that means? Oh, gosh. <laughs> Where did I say that? <laughs> I think it was on LinkedIn. <laughs> I found it somewhere um, it said uh, you need to, that startups need to focus on sales decks versus pitch decks. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, so, so you want to know what that means? Yeah. 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 So um, we we work with a lot of startups as as a company, right? And so we're just really sort of neck deep in the startup ecosystem and the startup environment. And when you're doing that, you actually see a lot of stuff that goes on from a very high level. Um, over the last four and a half years, we've work with about 300 plus different startup founders across 40 plus different industries um and uh and you get to you get to just see a lot of um stuff that goes on from you know a pre-seed round startup all the way through seed series a series b round of funding and beyond and uh my, my biggest i think my biggest criticism of the startup space or the startup culture in general that we've created in North America. I can't really speak to other parts of the world, but at least in North America is um, startups are really focused on pitch competitions. Um, startups are really focused on pitching to investors and pitching to a panel of judges to sort of win a, a trophy or a or a check from the pitch competition. And I've seen that play out like for many, many years, like going all the way back to 2017 when I first graduated from college and I first got into this space um, all, all the way till now. So, um, so what I mean by that is I think a lot of startups they're too focused on pitching to a, say a panel of judges or pitching to investors, right? Which is fine, uh, but they get into the habit of going from one pitch competition to another and they get into the habit of continually raising funding without ever being a sustainable profitable business right and as a startup like a lot of startups lose sight of the fact that as a business um the definition of a business is that you have to be a sustainable you have to be sustainable and profitable in the long run you have to have revenue you have to have customers Right, and there are many, there are too, a little bit too many startups that I talk to. Not talking about all startups, but a little bit too many startups I talk to. Um, their focus is not on revenue and getting customers in the door. Their focus is pitching to investors and creating a pitch deck uh, and pitching to judges that have pitched competition. Right. Um, neither of those two things validate the actual product. You can raise several million dollars, tens of millions of dollars of funding for your startup, that does not mean that that funding is equivalent to your product succeeding. What really dictates product success 
uh, in the success of a startup, I think is revenue growth, um, whether a startup can bring in customers and, and retain those customers over time and provide value to the customers, service those customers in a way that really disrupts the, the current status quo of whatever industry that particular startup is in, right? Changing the very dynamic. And that's the definition of a startup, right? It's, it's supposed to disrupt and change the dynamic of an entire industry. Uh, think about the, the earlier startup, like the ancient startups that sort of started back in 08 or the late 90s. Think about Google, you think about Microsoft, you think about Airbnb or Uber or these companies, they, they, they literally came in and sort of changed the dynamic in which the economy in that industry worked, right? And that's the, that's the definition of a startup. So, so that's the reason why I've, I've sort of um, kind of like floated that idea around where I've sort of preached that idea where, hey, focus on bringing in sales, focus on pitching to customers rather than pitching to a panel of judges or, or investors because customers is your biggest point of validation. Yeah, you're so right. And like, you know, also it'll go, go fundraise, go get VC money. You see, you no know, tech, you no know, tech crunch, require so and so raise this amount of money, right? But first of all, they might have raised $10 million, but the small point is to say they've been working at 10, 12 years, right? And then I think the stats show that even if you raise VC, you still don't have like a 1% chance of succeeding, right? It doesn't guarantee you're going to make it. Exactly. Exactly. I, I was talking to uh, a software developer yesterday, actually, that reached out to me and we, you know, got on a call and I got to know him better and he's based out of Austin. And um, he recently got laid off from, from a startup that raised $50 million in funding. Uh, and they took 1.5 million of the 50 million to actually build the product. And they completely blew the other uh, 80, $48.5 million on, on pivoting and switching to different industries and stuff like that. They started as a crypto blockchain app and then pivoted eventually to just a digital banking app. Um, those are very expensive pivots, right? Um, a lot of these startups, they raise a huge round of seed or, or series A funding. And, and that company, by the way, went under because they raised too much funding for their series A. Uh, and if you raise, if you sort of follow how the funding rounds go, uh, your later funding rounds has to be bigger yeah, then, well, you can't go underwater. I think it's called you can't go underwater. Something like right, that. yeah, you can't go underwater, right? So, so that just raised the bar so high that they, their company completely went under and they had to fire everyone uh, because they raised such a big round. And, and he was like, the company would be doing really, really well right now. They finally got a product going before they went under, but that product was, it was, you know, gaining traction. And he said that if the company had raised 1.5 or $2 million instead of 50, um, they would still be alive right now and they would be gaining a lot of traction. So it's just, it's just, you know, we're, we're living in this era and it's coming to an end right now with the, the Fed interest rate hikes and, 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 and the recessional economy that's, that's looming, you know, in across the world really. Um, but it, it's just this obscene amount of capital that has been dis deployed irresponsibly, uh, especially over the last two to three years with artificially low interest rates. Um, and stuff like that. The, the, just the amount of money that are uh, just out there is is crazy. I, I know a guy who is uh, here's another game. I know a guy who's like trying to build an app in the in the crypto space, and he met his co-founder on I think it was Twitter. So they never sort of met, but they assembled this co-founding team, and they're trying to raise a uh, a pre-seed round of funding at eight million dollars. But they're raising eight million dollars without a product and without any revenue. Um, Free seed round, eight million, man. Eight million, and, and that this just shows you how are, are they related? Are they related? Are, are they related to Elon Musk <laughs> or Zuckerberg or or Bill Gates or anything like that? No, no. I mean, he's not. Yeah, he, he's just a regular dude. Um, and uh, you know, I I wish the best for him. I think he's a very smart, very bright guy, and he you know recently quit his job at a big corporate company to, to do this. Um, but that just shows you how crazy it is that people will throw $8 million at an idea that is um, is, is pre-product. The product hasn't been developed. It will take two, two years to develop the product. And it will take, you know, maybe another three or four years or longer to make the company profitable if they generate revenue. So yeah. 
Um, so it's really interesting what's going on out there. So anyways, circling back to the original topic, like that's why I think startups should now be focused on, on revenue generation, on profitability and sustainability as a company. Because you look at, you look at the NASDAQ and over 40% of NASDAQ companies do not make money. They lose money every quarter. You look at um, this overall in, I think the, the top, I don't know, two or 3,000 companies in the United States, about 20% of those companies are zombie companies. They're funded by this low interest rate environment and they keep borrowing money to, to keep themselves alive, right? And that's about to completely shift as we sort of enter into this higher interest rate environment where the Fed is hiking up interest rates um, and, and money doesn't come as cheaply as it, as it did before. Yeah, I don't know. One thing is crazy. Like just a few months ago, there's all this VC money everywhere. Then there's like a snap of your finger, it's all cut off, right? Like you can't tell me about this drop powder just disappeared, right? It's like, oh, so <laughs> now, you, now you give them startups $10 million on an idea. Now, you know, it's something different, right? It's like too too quick of a switch, I think, but you know, who knows? Yeah, I think it's a very quick switch, especially in the, I've heard in the FinTech and crypto markets, especially, um, the sentiment has changed a lot uh, for for the followers of your podcast that actually follow sort of crypto movements, crypto price action. Uh, what happened recently with Luna and the price collapse there spooked a lot of people. Um, you know, Bitcoin recently dropped to around twenty thousand uh, dollars, up from as high of sixty nine thousand dollars. Pretty scary stuff. Um, so I think there's a lot of um, yeah, there's a lot of fearful sentiments out there right now, uh, especially in the blockchain crypto space, fintech space. So what's, what's the like, what's the national tech scene like right now? The tech startup scene in Nashville is like pretty vibrant, a lot of stuff going on there. Uh, you know, we, we got some bigger companies moving here. We got uh, Oracle that's, a, that's supposed to build its headquarters and finish its headquarters in Nashville around 2027 to 2028. Um, we got the second largest Lyft headquarters outside of San Francisco, Nashville. We got Alliance Bernstein, who moved their office from New York down to Nashville uh, about a year or two ago. Uh, Amazon opened the supply chain headquarters here, uh, around, I think, 3,000 people in that office. Um, so I think big tech is slowly moving some of their offices here. In terms of the startup ecosystem, is um, it's pretty close-knit, I would say. It's not as crazy as Austin or Chicago or Atlanta, New York, LA, Bay Area, um, but it's probably a, a secondary market. I can confidently say probably we got a decent amount of, um, you know, startups in our in our tight knit ecosystem. But it's nothing crazy though. It's uh, maybe a few hundred startups. Are, are startups so, able to raise money there, or they have to go to like different places to raise money? Well, uh, it's pretty difficult. Well, our, our startup, we haven't raised money yet, so we're fully bootstrapped up until this point. So I don't know exactly the, the actual environment in Nashville, but from what I heard, is it's pretty difficult if you don't know anyone. Um, so you have to network and really get to know some angel investors. There's a few really good angel investors in town. I, I know a few of them that that writes checks, you know, 25, 50, 100 grand checks for, for startups and stuff like that. Uh, there's a few VC funds, but a lot of them are sort of centered around healthcare tech. Um, Nashville is the healthcare service capital of the United States with HCA being um, being headquartered here and a bunch of other hospitals uh, around here, a bunch of healthcare companies headquartered out of Nashville. Um, so there's a lot of healthcare tech, uh, a little bit of music tech coming out of Nashville, um, but outside of that, it's not really a necessarily a friendly environment to start a startup that's uh, that's outside of those two sectors because the resources and the investment capital is just a, a little bit limiting here in Nashville. So how, how did you get involved with tech? Like, was well, that your degree in college? Or how did you get involved with software development? Uh, yeah, so pretty, pretty windy road in terms of how I got here. So I actually majored in uh, economics, minored in environmental studies at Vanderbilt. Um, and it was there where I met my co-founders, uh, when I was a sophomore rising junior at, at Vanderbilt and, um, 
and those co-founders, uh, you know, they're, they're still working with me today, give or take a, a few people that have left and came in over the years. But um, I met my CEO, Christian, uh, when I was a sophomore and he was a freshman at Vanville. And we just started building cool apps and products that we thought people would use. Um, and uh, at the time, it was just us fiddling with stuff i mean it, we're like it would be cool if we raised funding for this and uh eventually you know made it big and and exited um but none of those apps took off right so we we were just building these products and we learned a lot from them um but what eventually started to happen as we started building our own apps was people around nashville nashville entrepreneur center which is which is a, a incubator accelerator here in town had heard about what we're doing on campus and that was when they started to ask us, hey, can you design this application for us? And we sort of developed this application for us. And at first we turned that business down because we were like, no, 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 we only do, um, we only create our own apps. But eventually we just saw this as a huge opportunity. And that's when we really pivoted into the software development space, first doing some of the projects on our own. And eventually as more and more projects came in through referrals, um, we were still students, right? So we couldn't handle it completely on our own. So we had to create a system where we outsourced software development. Uh, and that was when we really got into the space of outsourcing. So we tried out many, many different models, uh, many different business models and um, many failed attempts later at trying to create a business. Back in the beginning of 2018, we finally pivoted into the business model that we are in now, which is trying to disrupt the software outsourcing space. Um, outsourcing specifically to software teams overseas in places like India, Eastern Europe, South America. Um, so that was when we pivoted into the, the current business model that, that we are in now, beginning of 2018. But it definitely took us a while to get there. First starting with creating our own applications, then we started making apps for other people. Then we started to try out different outsourcing models and none of those models really worked. Uh, major inefficiencies and flaws with each of those business models. Um, before finally stumbling upon, you know, what, what we're doing today. So what is your go-to coding language that you like to use all the time? Um, go-to coding language. Well, I can, I can say what's popular in the market right now. So with startups, um, you know, with mobile development, a lot of startups are using Flutter and React on the front end uh, with web most startups are using, um, sorry, with mobile is React Native and Flutter, and then with web is React JS on the website. And then on, on the back end side, there's, uh, I'm seeing a lot of Node.js uh, come into play. I'm seeing uh, a lot of Python for machine learning uh, and Django, which is a Python framework being developed on the back end um, as well. So those are some of the most popular frameworks that I'm seeing being used to develop mobile and, and web applications right now. So the when you bring all these software developers from other countries, like how do you vet them? Like how you validate that what they're doing, they can actually do what they say they can do. Yeah, so we have a specific vetting process. So um, our, our part of network is really, really small, right? So we don't let anyone just freely join as an Alamo partner. Um, they have to go through an extremely uh, tough vetting process where we review their design portfolio, their case studies. We have to check multiple US-based references. Um, we have to check, uh, you know, the and interview their upper management, their project managers, maybe talk to some developers. Um, and they have to go through a multi-step certification process to get certified to, to use our platform um, in order to interact uh, correctly with, with our clients. Um, so after all that's done, they get, Sort of soft onboarded to our network as a partner and they start receiving projects uh, from us and after that it's sort of a continual vetting process uh, from there so what that means is every two weeks we have an in-house alawa tech lead a developer kind of go in and, and assess the performance of each firm and see if they're following the right development process as they're committing code so on and so forth um, so they're producing an audit score for them based off of that, based off of that uh, development process audit and relaying that score back to the partner firm for further improvement. So if we 
see that score decline, we sort of have to put that firm on probation or even keep them out of the network um, if they're performing really poorly. And do y'all provide design services too or just software development? Uh, software development and design. So um, design services are, you know, user interface design, UI, UX design, um, plus development. So, so when a, a company signs up with you, how does it work? Like, like a company signs up with you and you're a developer and the company developer work one-on-one, -on -one, or do you all provide like a product manager or do you, or someone from the company that in between between the developer and the company? How does that work? Uh, most of the time is a team. Uh, it's a team comprised of a product manager or project manager, uh, a QA person, and anywhere between one to five or more developers for their development team. Um, we do have clients that are just looking for one resource and we do provide that for them as well. Uh, but, mo mo but most of the time people are looking to outsource an entire team um, overseas. And, and you are charged by hour, by project, or just a combination? It depends on the startup. So if the startup is building a minimum viable product, an MVP, um, and there's no existing code base, there's no existing work that has been done on a platform, they're designing and building everything from scratch, it's a project-based engagement, right? But if we're working with a more mature startup who's a C round, Series A, Series B startup, they already have a product, they already have revenue, they already have funding. Um, so what they're, what they're looking from us is more of a, a development team or what we like to call it staff augmentation uh, rather than an actual project. So we would give them a team of developers and we'll build them on a monthly basis or hourly basis. How, how do y'all deal with this? Like suppose someone comes in, you now here's a project I want you to do, you agree the money and like the product starts a week later, they start like doing like, what's it called? Um, um, creep, like a um, product creep, right? I need to add this now. I need scope to add creep. this. Scope creep, scope creep. How do y'all deal with scope creep? Yeah, so that's, uh... So there's only scope creep if you're doing everything on a fixed cost basis. So in terms of if you're doing it on a monthly basis or hourly basis. So when you when you look at how that works, there's um, you're really paying for the developer's time uh, for them to be there rather than paying for the scope that's being delivered. Um, so in those type of engagements, there's actually no such thing as scope creep when you're paying a monthly retainer or paying hourly for your development team. Is sort of an all you can eat buffet, right? You can just give them like whatever you want them to work on and they'll work on it and they'll bill you for the hours that's being worked on. Um, for MVP projects, there is scope creep with almost every single project. Um, and that's just, that's just the norm of it. Uh, and how we deal with that is on our platform, there's a way to open up additional request tickets, uh, either by the development firm or the client. And you have to state what you, what, what ticket you're opening, the description of the ticket, the reason for opening, um, and the development team will sort of put the extra number of hours and the cost in there. Uh, and, and the client has to approve, reject, or deny, or dispute um, that additional request ticket. So it's all streamlined through our platform, uh, removing the friction uh, that it normally takes when you sort of bring that up to a client and, uh, you know, talk to them about change requests and stuff like that. And how do y'all deal with tech debt? That's a great question. Uh, so technical debt is, um, do you want me to explain that concept? Yeah, 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 explain, yeah. yeah, explain, yeah. Um, so, so technical debt is really interesting. So technical debt is pretty much uh, the concept of, um, let me use an analogy first. So imagine if someone is writing a research paper for, a professor, a seminar in college, and they have a, a particular deadline that they have to write the research paper in. About three months, they have to write this 50-page research paper. And, and you iterate through the research paper in drafts, right? So the first draft is due, not in three months, the first draft is actually due in one month. And you wanna write that first draft as fast as you can, but it's not gonna be clean, right? The syntax is not gonna be clean. You don't have all your references there. There may be some grammatical errors and misspellings, but you need to turn that rough draft in to the professor in order to get that grade, right? So that's essentially equivalent to the minimum viable product, the MVP, which typically has a lot of technical debt if you build it right. Uh, you can take years to build it and eliminate technical debt, but if you build it right, you should have a lot of technical debt 
not so much so that's not scalable or not usable after the MVP is, you know, gains traction and is supposed to be scaled, but we also have enough technical debt to where you can build it in about six months, which is really, really fast for MVP development. Uh, launch into the market, prove the validity of your hypothesis, uh, and then scale your product from there. Now, the going back to the research paper essay analogy, as you write different uh, versions of the essay, you're iterating on that uh, original essay and you're making that essay research paper better. You're adding all of your reference points. You're, you're annotating and editing the syntax and the grammatical errors, and you're making sure that everything is spelled correctly. Um, you're making sure the essay flows from point to point and the arguments are really, really good. Um, and uh, at the end, you have a, a finalized research paper that you're ready to turn in at the end of the semester. Now that's the progress, the same thing as sort of writing code for a product that is going from MVP to a more mature product, version two, version three, version four. Um, in the, in the industry, we do something called code refactoring, uh, where the developer goes in and sort of optimizes the code base to make uh, the code base more scalable, um, make it better, more efficient. Uh, and that's sort of analogous to you writing the research paper and making that research paper more uh, readable, less grammatical errors, less syntax errors to finally turn into to the professor as a finalized research paper. Now, the difference between a research paper and a technical product is the technical product should be continually iterated forever. Uh, as long as the technical product lives, there's no end to it versus an essay. Sometimes you, you get to a certain point and you're like, all right, this is good enough. I'm turning it in for the final grade. With a technical product, there's no such thing unless you close down shop and you go out of business. You should continually iterate on your product and continue to make it better and pay off that technical debt over time. What what makes someone a good software developer is like no attention to the detail, ability to learn, being curious, being a great problem solver, or something totally different. You know, I, I'm not a developer myself, but, <laughs> but uh, I've worked with enough developers to to sort of get a good idea of I think like what comprises a good developer. So I think yeah, you know, they a really really great developer ideally would have a really great problem solving mind. They're able to write code in a very efficient manner. They're able to ask very critical questions and they're able to listen and communicate really, really well. So you're having both the soft skills, the empathy and the communication skills, you're having the listening skills and the skill to ask questions. And you have the skill to actually produce good logic and solve problems in a very efficient way. Um, very, very, very few developers have all of these traits. Um, so I say like in the very least, obviously a developer, if they lack in the communication and soft skills and listening skills, uh, critical thinking skills, um, sorry, maybe not that. So you need, you need critical thinking to solve problems, but at least the soft skills, um, can be done away by some sort of a project manager or some sort of a lead developer that's managing them. Um, so they have, you know, really, really good critical thinking skills and problem solving skills. They can be a really good developer. Um, they might not be able to go too far in terms of passing a level two or senior level developer and go into management. They might not be able to manage the actual team effectively, but they can be a really, really good developer without developing the, the soft skills and maturing that part. So how, 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 how do y'all deal with this? This is a challenge I had when I first started out as a non-tech founder. Like uh, I use an analogy, like you, you ask, uh, you know, John, John opened the door. John gets up, opens the door. You ask John the developer, you gotta say, John the developer, get up between your angle, do a 20 degree percent thrust, turn the door away, 90 degrees left, pull it out with this thrust right. So it's like with the, with the developer, you gotta say, you know, very good for you can say to say one through 10, but developer, you gotta say one A, 1A1, 1A2. And I think a lot of non-tech founders don't get that at first, right? And it's like, how do you work through that kind of stuff to make sure the communication is good? Uh, to make sure the communication is good between the, the founder, a non-technical yeah. founder and a developer? Yeah, yeah. 
Um, are you talking about before the project begins or the, like after, like during the actual project? Uh, but both of you know, like how do, how do, how do we make sure the not tech founders like articulating in detail what the developers you know to make a good for great product versus they're saying, hey, a, a, a non tech founder must, hey, I want an orange button on, on their page where it should be, you know, I want an orange button on this page on the left hand corner at, you know, this diameter because it's going to do this. That's a good question. So for us, um, we take the client through a specific process. Uh, we like to call it the four D's, right? Four D's of software development, discovery, design, develop, and deploy. And we take them specifically through those four steps in that specific order. Um, and that order is very, very important, specifically for non-technical founders, but it's important for everyone who's trying to build a product, whether physical or a non-tangible product, like a software product. Um, so in the discovery phase, we get the founder to really express their ideas and we teach them how to write features and user stories. It's not hard to teach people uh, if, if you know people don't know how to actually write those things. Is we have an ebook on our website that you know people can download and people can easily follow how to write a feature, how to write a user story. And once you have that scope document ready, um, you're pretty much ready to go into some sort of a basic wireframe, right? Wireframe the basic outlines of what you want the platform to be. After the wireframes are solidified, then you can move into something called a, a high fidelity design. Now the wireframing in the industry, we call that a low fidelity design, which means there's no colors yet. It looks kind of crappy. It looks kind of chunky, clunky, um, but, the purpose of what the wireframe serves is to solidify the, the general layout of the application and to make sure that the, the founder is okay with everything being laid out the way it is. So after that's designed, we then move into a, um, a high fidelity design slash prototype where you actually add the colors and, and fonts into it. And after that's done, we actually start developing the application. So I think, with non-technical founders specifically, they have to build up to that point of it being developed. Now with technical founders is different because um, they typically already know how to wireframe products or even design products. Uh, a lot of technical clients have served as product managers or CTOs for previous companies. So they would come to us with a prototype or, or wireframe already done. And they say, hey, all I need is a high fidelity design. All I need is for these screens to be implemented uh, and for a development team to do that, right? So the requirements are pretty clear. It's almost technical. Uh, they typically already have written down user stories and acceptance criteria and stuff like that. But with the non-technical founder, we have to sort of slowly build up to that and really teach them how to write user stories, how to write features, and then get their sort of design team to translate those user stories and features into wireframe and design. So what, what's your advice? Suppose there's a person out there, brand new developer, just finished college or graduated from Code Academy, and they're trying to find their first job. What advice do you have for this person? Um, hmm. Well, uh, given that I, I couldn't find a job out of college, I, I'm not sure if I'm the best person to ask. Uh, but uh, I'd say the best advice I can give to anyone that's maybe coming out of school and they're trying to find a job. I'd say, you know, if, if I were to, if I were to talk to my past self and give myself advice, I would say that the, the questions that you ask is more important than the answers that you give in the job interview. Um, and what I mean by that is sort of, you have to be inquisitive, uh, you have to be curious, and you have to have a natural desire to uh, learn more about the company that you're being interviewed by, that you're applying to, because that shows interest and that shows intelligence, uh, right, to the interviewer. Right, rather than just answering interview questions, which is good, you have to answer those questions in the correct way or in the way that they want in order to get the job right. But I think now 
I'm being on, I'm on the other side and I interview people to be part of my sales team. I'm looking for how inquisitive they are, especially if they're in sales or in business. I want to learn how inquisitive they are, how many questions they ask, what type of questions do they ask? Are they good questions or bad questions? Um, so I say, yeah, like the, the questions that you ask is more important than answers that you give uh, when you're interviewing with, with different companies. Yeah, I always say, if you want to guarantee you not get the job, ask no, ask no questions at the interview. That's I think that guarantees you're not going to get the job. Won't go and get right. the job on me. Exactly, exactly. And and another thing I would say is, uh, as much as the as much as the company or organization is interviewing you, you should also be interviewing them. Right? They're interviewing you as the candidate to see if you'd be a good fit for the company or organization. Um, you should be interviewing them to see if they are a good fit for you. Uh, and that's something that I never took into account uh, when I was job searching and graduated from college because I was so desperate on trying to get a job that I was just trying to, you know, appease people in an interview or trying to land a job uh, without ever really asking or seeing if that job was a right fit for me, right? And in order to see a job is right fit for you or not, you have to ask them a bunch of questions about different stuff like management structure, management culture, um, pay structure, all, all of those, you know, are, are good questions. And there are many other questions that you can ask. Um, and then, uh, you know, an employer that then makes a good impression. Um, so y'all have like around 300 clients. Can you talk through like how, how you got so many clients so fast? Or what's the process? Like you have, I guess you have a, a, uh, a great marketing plan, how that works. Yeah, well, I, what, let me clarify. So I, we worked with 300 plus different founders. At, at the, the startups that we work with typically have two to three founders. Um, so as I say, in terms of actual clients, we work with uh, around, I don't know, uh, around 200 clients, maybe I mean, 150. That's, that's still a good um, number. But, uh, but yeah, I wanted to clarify there. But uh, how would you, I mean, we, we also been around for a long time, though. Uh, Right around four and a half years almost. So it's a lot of word of mouth or do you do any advertising or ads or anything? Word of mouth is still really strong for us. We try to keep up the good work. We try to retain clients. We try to serve clients to the best of our ability. Um, and that naturally in the startup world, founders talk to other founders about, um, about us, about our product and about the service, right? So uh, we have a, pretty good referral pro program uh, where we sort of give a kickback of anyone that refers as a client that ends up going through. Um, we have pretty strong partnerships with uh, small and big organizations that's able to sort of um, give us, uh, intro us to different startups with software development needs. So we're, we're partners with uh, organizations like um, Draper House or 1871 from Chicago, which is a huge incubator um, out there in the Midwest. We're partners with uh, VC firms. We're partners with maybe different uh, marketing agencies, development agencies, and stuff like that that are able to make intros for us. Um, and then, yeah, on the marketing side, we uh, just recently ramped up marketing about a little less than two years ago. Um, so we're, we got a little bit more of a web presence now. Uh, ramping up SEO, things like Google ads, um, content creation, uh, publishing blog, and stuff like that. So uh, that's definitely helped us a decent amount um, in terms of gaining even more traction. So I think, uh, in my opinion, you know, right now we're scaling to 10 million a year in annual revenue um, in the next year to year and a half. And I think from zero to 10 million, you can build a business on word of mouth and business development. Um, from 10 million, we want to scale to 100 million in about six to seven years, right? So 10 to 100 million is going to be a completely different ballgame and it's going to be a lot harder to scale with word of mouth and business development. So a lot of the 10 to 100 million uh, scaling game would have to be mainly pulled by uh, brand recognition, brand equity, ads, content creation all of that stuff. So, um, and of course, word of mouth and, yes. and uh, business development will assist that. Uh, but up until now, our main source of business majority has come from our partnerships and, and word of mouth. 
what's your process for this? And I have no idea if this happened yet, but have you ever had a, where you had a quote unquote fire, fire a customer because it wasn't a match or something to work out? And how do you go about doing that? Cause I think it's important that you have to be able to fire a customer sometimes, I think. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. We, um, it doesn't happen often, but I can account for, gosh, how many times, maybe three or four times total that has happened to us in the, in the history of our company. Um, we, we try our best to never turn any, turn any bridges. You know, we always, um, whenever there's a conflict, we always try practicing turning the other cheek and, you know, dealing with our clients in a loving and, and gentle way, in a very respectful way. Um, and uh, we, we've never, up until this point, you know, knock on wood, we've never had any legal uh, action or, or, or legal um, lawsuit come up with us, uh, even though there's been a decent amount of client fires. And a few of those client fires have led to us you know, terminating an agreement or led to us firing a certain client because, um, you know, they were not complying with our contract or some, some clients were simply like very, very rude and unprofessional to our developers. Uh, and, and that's sort of a uh, you know, we kind of have a, a zero to tolerance, zero tolerance policy against certain stuff like that. If you're, you know, being racist against a foreign developer and you're saying racial slurs or something like that, and just being outright rude, right? Um, yeah. You know, we can't be working with those type of clients because then our partners would wouldn't want to work with us because then we're bringing them clients that are difficult to work with. So, um, so yeah, we've had to have a few tough conversations with them and but we always do it in a very respectful and a very gentle way like hey xyz customer um we really enjoyed you know our relationship so far i think due to xyz issues um that have come up in recent times i don't think it's a good fit for us to continue our partnership or collaboration with us with each other further so love to help you transition to your new development team uh let me know how i can best assist you in that so something like that right that's it's very respectful, very gentle. We try not to burn any bridges and say, uh, you're a bad person. We never want to talk to you again. You never want to do that in the world of business because no, um, no, you don't. You really want to create a you really want to create a business as you really want to try to be as blameless as possible. And and blameless doesn't mean perfect. It just means that uh, people you don't give people the rock to to be able to throw at you um, because you you've treated them with respect and kindness. And, you know, they have nothing good to, but good things to say about you. So, yeah. So, so walk us through this. Like, suppose, suppose there's a non tech founder right there. Non tech founder has a little bit of money, has an idea, and he needs to decide, you know, is he going like, to go try to find a CTO or senior developer to work with him? Is he going to like outsource or is he going to take the time to learn to code himself? Which one of those options? Yeah, like what's what, like yeah, like talk about the pros and cons of each one. Like should I should I cut like someone should cut this? Let me just break down yeah. for a year and learn to code myself, or go find a you know maybe give half the company away to, to another to the developer or outsource. Come through the pros and cons of each one, right? Right, right. Well, before they start that, the thing I would say that a lot of founders actually miss and jump the gun, the, the jump the gun a little bit too far on is too fast on is um they need to do market research you need to validate your product idea and the validity and the your your product until it's used by users and it generates revenue is pretty it's pretty much just a hypothesis right um it's not a business yet it's a hypothesis so you want to validate that hypothesis before you turn it into actual business because the moment you turn it into actual business there's a lot of investment that needs to go in you need to invest in designing and developing the product. You need to invest in uh, legal fees. You need to invest in marketing dollars. You need to invest in so much time and energy gets invested in this. And I've seen way too many founders go one, two, three, even four years, even more years down the road. Um, and they have a product, they have some users, they raise a bunch of money. But again, like going back to that first topic that we talked about, there's no validation there. They haven't generated any revenue or they generated very little amounts of revenue, right? 
Um, so they still haven't gotten any traction. So that goes back to the root cause of, okay, in the very beginning that they do enough market research to validate uh, the hypothesis of, of their business, of their startup. Um, and if a lot of startup founders honestly ask themselves that, they would say, no, like I haven't validated my idea in the first place. So that's the first thing I would say before you even jump into finding a CTO or learning how to code yourself or learning how to learn, finding an outsource development team. Those are all very energy and time intensive things, right? So, so you wanna make sure that you're investing your time and energy and money um, into, into the right thing. Uh, and not something that that is just an idea because you think is a good idea. No, you have to market. You have to you have to actually um, validate the idea. Make sure that it's good first before you step into finding a CTO or building out your own product or outsourcing that product. Um, and you all are a fully remote company, correct? Yeah, we are. Can you talk about the advantages and disadvantages of that? Yeah. Um, Gosh, there's very little disadvantages. I can only think of advantages. Um, I mean, the disadvantages, I, I guess, you know, we, we do a company retreat about every six months and we get together as a team. We fly to a different city. Like we want to meet in Seattle and the Pacific Northwest uh, soon uh, as a team. So we fly everyone out to a different city um, and, and we meet up as a team for about four or five days. Uh, and those are those are always really fun, right? We, we progress a lot in terms of brainstorming, and working together as a team. So that's something that we definitely lack as a remote team is like, we only get to have, you know, that in-person time about once or twice a year. But the advantages are tremendous. I mean, the biggest advantage being, uh, we don't have any overhead costs in terms of office. You don't have to deal with any of that. Um, so we're operating on a super, super, super lean um, level as a company. And then the second advantage, big advantage is we can work wherever, wherever we want, whenever we want, um, as long as we get the work done. So we have people all over the place. One of our co-founders is a digital nomad. He, he's traveled, he's been traveling all over South America and he's planning to travel Europe in, in about a month or so. So um, yeah, those are some huge advantages. I'd say being a full remote team. So yes. change the subjects. Besides writing country music, what do you what do you do for fun? What do I do for fun? Um, I love uh, I love playing tennis. I'm a huge tennis player. Um, so love playing tennis, love watching tennis. Um, my wife and I we we love like opening up our home and sort of hosting people on the weekends, um, really blessing people with with a dinner. I uh, love, love cooking dinner for people and just having people over, over at a house and um, yeah, having intentional conversations, you know. Uh, we love going out to eat the different restaurants and stuff like that in Nashville because Nashville is a huge, has a huge food scene, but um, you know, it, 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 nothing, really, nothing really parallels or compares to having someone in your home and having a conversation with them for, you know, four to five hours and having that intentional conversation, right? Um, and and, and yeah. then how, how do you take care of yourself? How, how do you take care of your wellness, your health, all that kind of stuff? How to take care of, I, I wouldn't say I'm the best at it, but, but I, I try to, um, you know, we, as a, as a company, we have KPIs for each person and a, a lot of people, we, we call it a health and mental sorry, mental health and wellness KPI that um, a lot of us have to hit. So we take those as seriously as we take any other work KPIs that we have to hit. Um, so for some people, it could be, you know, do weightlifting for 30 minutes a day or someone for someone else, it could be walk outside for 30 minutes a day, right? Um, so we try to keep the team at a, accountable to a relatively decent health level um for me personally i just try to exercise like three or four times a day uh do something active get outside whether that's a, a 30 minute walk or whether that's playing tennis or whether that's you know lifting weights in the gym and and you know getting getting physically stronger try to do one of those three things throughout the course of the week so how, how do you do this like i'll make this number up like close tomorrow you had, you had like 30 things to do tomorrow right on your list 
how do you make sure you do things one and two versus going to number 27 first? So you had like a long to-do list? Yeah, suppose you have like 30 things to do tomorrow. Instead of going number 30, how do you make sure you focus and do number one, number two? Like how do you make sure you focus on your priorities versus just doing whatever? Hmm. That's a good question, right? So I think it goes back to the four quadrants. Um, if your listeners have ever sort of gone over that with them in terms of sort of urgent, urgent tasks versus important tasks, right? So there's some tasks that are important and not urgent. Some tasks are urgent and not important. Some tasks that are both urgent and important. And some tasks that are neither urgent nor important. And those are something that you need to completely ignore. Right. So, um, so I think in terms of prioritization of tasks, you can prioritize it in that way in terms of knocking out the things that are important and urgent. Um, those I think should take number one priority. And then the next priority should be um, urgent, but not as important. And then the third priority for me would be important, but not urgent. Uh, and then everything else comes after, after that. So. So you already, you already talked about your company some, but can you go more detail, like how the company got started, what you focus on right now, and what you all see the future or in the vision of the company being like going forward? Yeah, we, uh, yeah, I mentioned a little bit about how we started. So, um, you know, we started back in 2018, but went through several pivots, several other business ideas before that. Um, so, oh, here's here's a cool story. I'll, I'll tell you a cool story of, of how we, initially got uh, started with our company funding. So, so we're fully bootstrapped company. We don't have any outside capital or, or investors. So we totally just bootstrapped this thing uh, over the last four and a half years. But when we got started in 2018, um, I was the first one that graduated. My co-founders were still in college. And uh, if you remember, like in college, I, I said we did a few projects as students, we had a LLC registered. We had a business bank account. So we had about, I want to say like $15,000 in the business bank account. Um, and when I jumped into the startup full-time, we almost decided to liquidate that before I jumped into it full-time because we didn't really see a future for our company. We just thought, all right, let's walk away with, you know, four or five grand each. That's, you know, and my co-founder was like, Dawei doesn't have a job right now, so that will help them out a lot. <laughs> and um, and they were still in college, so that was a decent, not that much money now, but like to a student back in- Yeah, that's a lot of money, college right? student. Back, back in 2017, and you're coming out of college and you don't have any money, you know, let's just liquidate it. We'll start something else later in life. Let's just call it quits. So I called up my CEO um, and I was like, hey, I, I really feel like, I really feel like God's calling for me to do this, man. Like, I, I want to do this full time. I want to give it a try. Uh, just give me one shot. You don't have to pay me. Like, I want to, I want to just, be, I want to give this a full time shot. Um, so, anyways, we decided to sort of, instead of liquidating that amount, we decided to take um, sort of that amount of capital and reinvest uh, back into the company and snowballed that $15,000 into a seven figure business. Um, so that was sort of how we got started. Uh, we did have a little bit of capital to work with, uh, and that capital went to paying out my sort of my, my first year salary. You know, I kind of pay myself eight bucks an hour, uh, when I first started out. And, nothing, uh, still too had crazy. To drive. nothing too crazy. Yeah. It's just, just, just nothing too crazy. Still have to drive lift on the side to make ends meet. You know, I could barely break even at that point. And, um, and we were really, really lean, right? Again, my co-founders were still in college or they, they went to take jobs at Google and Amazon and Capgemini. And, um, you know, a, a year later, uh, we had pulled enough revenue into where they ended up quitting their jobs at those companies and jumping on board for the time back in 2019. And that was when, uh, you know, we really grew from, um, you know, in 2020, we doubled our revenue uh, 2021 we doubled again and then we're, we're on track to double again our revenue this year in 2022 um so but in the beginning it was just me full-time it, it was a very lonely gig um my co-founders were on slack with me but they were working full-time gigs right they were working you know one co-founder was still in school 
um, three other founders were were working at these big companies. So it was really just me kind of on this Slack workspace alone throughout the course of the day. Um, so that's interesting times, interesting times for sure. Like when we first got started, but I think we're, where we're going now, um, you know, we're scaling to 10 million in revenue. After that, we'll try to scale from 10 million to hundred million within about six to seven years as a company. We'll see how long that takes. It could take longer than that, maybe eight to nine, maybe 10 years, <laughs> who knows? Who knows? We're here to um, really, uh, we, we really want to focus more on quality um, and we won't, we will never forsake quality for the sake of scale. Um, so we really want to keep the quality high and deliver uh, high quality outsourcing um, for our clients. And in the long term, I think we want to be the the gold standard for not just software outsourcing, but any type of outsourcing. Uh, so you go on a platform where you can find, manage, pay, um, view data insights into any type of outsourcing engagement all through one platform. Um, so that could be software outsourcing, that could be outsourcing marketing, that could be outsourcing um, accounting, uh, different types of high skill, la uh, high skill labor. Um, so we definitely want to get into the vertical in the future. So. Yes. Um, so you know, there's like, you know, so many companies out doing you know, software development outsourcing, right? Like, it's like there are a dime or dozen. What do y'all do differently from other, from other ones that make y'all so much better? Yeah, so I think the way we in which we view the problem and the way in which we have um, we operate our philosophy is entirely different than our direct competitors. So first of all, we're not an agency, right? So we're, we're a closed marketplace that leverages um, technology and data insights to be able to de-risk software outsourcing operations and increase success rate of software outsourcing. Um, so our competitors, um, all of the competitors that we've done research on, I'd say they, they're, they all provide a highly vetted marketplace. Um, some provide a, a payment engine to be able to pay out that developer, but there's no, um, there's no vertical integration there, right? So the problem with solving um, and making any type of economy more efficient, not just the software development economy, but any type of gig economy more efficient is not a vertical issue, but rather a horizontal issue. So what I mean by that is throughout the course of uh, an engagement with a, with a particular resource in the supply chain, there's multiple parts of that engagement or multiple areas of that engagement that has an efficiency, right? In finding and vetting, matching the client to the right resource, it only solves one of the verticals, but it does not solve the rest of the verticals um, when it comes to working with that resource. And that's especially true when you're working with a software team or software developer, because so many things can go wrong after you're finding and, uh, finding and vetting. Um, so just creating a highly vetted pool of developers who are highly qualified and highly vetted and you match them to the right team does not actually solve the problem of the software development economy as a whole. We only solve the problem of finding and vetting, which is about 5% of the entire problem that we face in the entire market. So then you have to ask, what about accountability? What about transparency, project management, international payment, um, all of those things. So, you know, we, what we've done is we created a platform that uh, is able to solve those problems through our project management tool, through our payment tool uh, and data insights um, to create more transparency into your software development team. How many people are on your team? Right now there's only six. So we have a pretty small, pretty small core team. And uh, there's always a, you know, a class of interns with us uh, every semester. So, um, we typically have about three or four interns with us. And, and well. so when you say the team only six, that's not counting the software developers. No. Yeah. So the software developers are our partners, right? So they're not our full-time employees. So within our partner network, we have 10 global partners, over a thousand de designers, developers, project managers within our partner network. Um, so, so there's a, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, 
resources that we can tap into. There's a lot of leverage that we create with our partner network. Okay. So the developers are actually, they're not employees of you. They're like more like contractors or like partners, like you said. Right. Yeah. Partners more like almost like a subcontractor, but we're, we're not acting as a subcontractor, right? We're acting as a platform and we give our infrastructure and platform out as a service. Um, and our contract sort of stipulates that the development team is responsible for development and Alawa is responsible for our platform. We're responsible for the audits and the relationship management piece. Um, so we kind of decouple that responsibility there to where um, the liability of the projects doesn't necessarily fall on us, right? That sort of creates a pretty big scaling problem if you scale to uh, 20, 30, 50, 100 active projects, if you're acting as a subcontractor. So you, you already gave some great advice how to, you know, like, you know, do, you know uh, validate, your, validate your idea, different things like that. Can you give any more advice, like maybe a brand new entrepreneur, like just getting started out? Uh, just getting started out. Um, man, there's so many good ones. Um, the one I always like to give is one of my favorite quotes is fall in love with the problem, not the solution. Um, I think we might have touched on that slightly, but what that pretty much means is you want to fall in love with, you want to be obsessed with the pain points and the problems of the market and solving that problem rather than creating a solution that you think is good and falling in love with the product or solution that you've created. Um, you want to absolutely be obsessed with solving other people's problems and creating a solution and product that solves other people's problems. Um, so that's something that we had to learn the hard way through several failures as we created products that we loved not necessarily the market love because it didn't address actual market pain points. So you, so going back to that market research topic, right? You actually want to do the market research to discover pain points um, because all a business is at the end of the day is you as an entrepreneur or a business owner, you see a need or a pain point in the market and you're filling that need with your product or service and you're charging a specific price for your product or service based off of the the how how big that pain point is in the market um that's all that business is is you're, you're providing you're seeing a need you're filling that need with a product or service and you're charging money for that product or service so that you can continue providing that product or service in the market um and the money that you charge should be equivalent to the value in which you provide in the actual marketplace um so without a problem Without a pain point, there is no business. And unfortunately, in the startup space, we're seeing a lot of businesses being created that are not actually solving problems. Very true, very true. Can, can you talk real fast, like how you figured out your pricing model? Like, was it, do you just come to the price model off the top of your head or you had like do several iterations to figure out what the right pricing model would be for y'all, what y'all provide? We went through several pricing models. I, I mean, we stumbled upon just a very simple pricing model of, um, all of the payments are paid through our platform to our developers. Uh, and we just take a percentage cut of that, uh, depending on the size of the project, we take a percentage cut um, for our uh, our payment processing, for using our, our infrastructure, our tools, and for our services that we provide in terms of account management, development audits, so on and so forth. So. Um, is there anything I should have asked you that I haven't asked you yet or anything else you want to talk about? Um, gosh, is there anything that you haven't asked? You asked me a lot of great questions. Thanks. I don't know. I, I feel like I'm, I, I need to get to know you a little bit better. <laughs> <honest>. <laughs> um, but no, that's, that's, um, that's pretty much it. I, I think that you've, you've asked a lot of great questions. And, Thanks. Um, definitely, uh, really appreciate, really appreciate your time, uh, taking your time out to, to be able to do this. Yes. Um, I think we've had a lot of great conversations, uh, so far <laughs> yes hey can you give uh, give us your social media for yourself and your company so people can reach out to you sure yeah uh i'm not really on actual social media outside of linkedin so uh, on linkedin people can find me um dawei lee so d-a-w-e-i space l-i um i'm pretty much one of the only dawei's on on dawei lee's on linkedin so it's not hard to find me but um but yeah uh, I don't, I'm not really on, on Instagram or Facebook anymore, so don't try to find me on there. <laughs> um, so yeah, if you need to reach me, reach, reach me on LinkedIn and, 
um, you can just search my name. And um, for our listeners who have the links to your social media, or specifically the links on our show notes, you'll find our show notes at www.cavernousatroblaw.com. Be sure to uh, share this episode with your friends and network and uh, rate, subscribe, review the Jason Cabin experience on your favorite platform. So we're coming out of a talk. Can you give us any adv last minute advice on anything you want to talk about? Um, gosh, last bit of advice. I'll say just uh, just the last piece of advice in life. I mean, that this is something that I had to learn again, learn the hard way is just, uh, you know, take take life slow and um, life's too short to, to be walking fast. You know, um, I always try to stop and smell the roses and try not to rush places and, um, you know, try to try to enjoy it. Try to enjoy the journey uh, instead of focusing on the destination. So, um, life life definitely moves by fast. Uh, I know I'm super young. I'm only 27. <laughs> like I, I shouldn't be saying all this stuff, but like seriously, like the last six, seven, eight years of my life has just really um, flown by pretty fast. And uh, you know, I'm almost 30 years old now. So <laughs> uh, it definitely definitely flows. Oh, gosh, it just it literally feels like. A, a, you know, not too long ago, I was like a sophomore freshman in college. So uh, I, I, that's something that I try to live by, that philosophy, um, just to try to be present and, you know, try to try to slow life down a little bit, you know, get off of social media, stop watching Netflix and uh, go outside and stare at some trees or something. <laughs> you know, um, life's too short. So, yeah, that's all I got. <laughs> Darway, thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Jason. Really appreciate you having me. And to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. Remember to be great every day.